Hey guys, welcome to our service. I'm so glad that you're tuning in today. If you didn't know, Church on the Move is a family of churches. We have three locations across Northeast Oklahoma. So if you live near one of our locations, come out and join us in person. We have incredible worship and teaching, and of course, amazing environments for kids and students that we want you and your family to experience for yourselves. If you have questions, you can drop a comment below or visit churchonthemove.com for more info. Now enjoy the service. Well, are we ready for the book of Revelation? Come on. Right. Revelation chapter 1. We have been anticipating prayerfully and uh, preparing and getting ready. And some of us are excited. Some of us are anxious. Some of us are fearful. And uh, there's different types of people in the room. And um, a few of us are what I would call... And you, you might not call yourself this, but I would, I would genuinely and sincerely call you uh, an expert on the book of Revelation because you might refer to yourself as just a student of the book, but you have throughout your life and throughout your relationship with God and your time in the church, you, you've just been a student of the book. You, you've read it, you've leaned into it, and you just prayerfully considered what the book has to say. You, you've actually read it and thoughtfully considered, what does this have to say to me as a believer, as a follower of Jesus? And, and you're here today just to continue to learn and just, I, I want to know more. I want to hear more perspective and I want to listen to the Spirit of God and I want to grow in my relationship with Jesus. And, and I just want to say I am humbled that you would be here and just come with that kind of attitude. You're an example to the rest of us. As a matter of fact, we'll, we, we probably wouldn't even know that you're here with just your humility and the way that you carry yourself. And my hope is that one day the majority of our church would be people like you that are just students of the Word of God. There, There's a different kind of expert that's here today, a few of us that are deeply excited that we're talking about the book of Revelation. And finally, it's like time, yes. And, and, and you get excited about some of the secrets of the book and some of what I would call some of the conspiracy theories of the book. And you like to tie this verse to that verse and you you've read all of the books and all of the kind of prophets and theologians and you you've you know you've tied this to that and matter of fact you're so intrigued by the book of revelation like you have a hidden room in your house that is filled with resources that your spouse doesn't know about and you have a room in that or a wall in that room that looks a little bit like this that you have you, you have tied this verse to that verse to this newspaper article from 1963 that's tied to this world leader, that's tied to this Mayan calendar that has cracked the code and the secret, and you know the predictions. And matter of fact, you have at times made a couple of predictions that might have been wrong, but you keep making a couple of predictions, and you know the secret and the timeline, and you're just here to see if I know what you know, and, and hoping that like we kind of uncover the curtain and the timeline, and if we reveal who he is and what that is and, and when he is coming. And, and, and if, if you're hoping that we reveal some of the secret and the headlines and, and this and that, I, I want to just gently let you down that you might be disappointed <laughs> a little bit. But I want to encourage you to just lean in because I think God has something for you throughout this series as well. Um, and, and then there's another group of people that I would call assumers. And, and I call you assumers because you have made some assumptions and formed some opinions about the book. Um, because you've heard a podcast, you've read an article, you've listened to a message, you've heard a TED Talk, um, you, you saw a headline, and you formed an assumption and you've crafted an opinion about what the book has to say but you've not actually read what the book has to say. 
you, you read a verse, you've read a thing, and you've heard a thought, but you've not actually studied. And so my encouragement for you is to hold those assumptions loosely and to not hold them tightly. And to maybe for the first time in your life over the next few weeks with us in partnership with the Holy Spirit, actually read what is in the book. To, to open it and to read along with us what the book has to say and what John is saying and what Jesus is saying to his church. And to see if maybe some of those assumptions that you formed don't become unraveled and if the Spirit of God doesn't teach you something new and powerful that has a profound effect on your life. And then probably the largest group of people in here are where I honestly have to say I have lived for the majority of my life. There's a group of people that I call the avoiders because we have at all costs avoided this book. And matter of fact, I have already talked to some of you, some of us, I will say us affectionately, that have been honest with me and said, I have really considered not coming for the next few weeks. But those that have already been here said, I'm, I'm glad that I have been here. And the reason that we avoid this book is that we don't understand this book. And we've heard weird, scary, unrelatable things that we don't know what to do with. We've read it, but it's confused us. We've heard messages on us on it that just don't make sense. We've been scared by it. We've watched movies about it. And it just doesn't make any sense. I've been in the church a long time and I have a relationship with Jesus that's very deep and very personal. And I know the character of God and I know the goodness of God and I know the faithfulness of God. And I know that God loves me and I know that God's forgiven my sins. And I just haven't known what to do with this. I know he's coming back sometime. I don't know when, I don't know how. And I just I said, I'm just going to avoid this and kind of put it on the shelf and then it'll all kind of work itself out. But over the last few years, I've, at the leading of the Holy Spirit and at the push of others, I've been encouraged to take it off the shelf and kind of begin to dig into it begin to study it, and I begin to see the life in it. And for, so, for those of us that have avoided it, I just want to encourage you to walk through the fear and walk through the confusion and the cloudiness and to see what the Spirit of God might say to you through this because there's some very powerful, hopeful stuff in here. And really today, I want to just answer four simple questions that get us started and kind of build a foundation. The first one is, how should we approach this book? Because I think that's where a lot of people miss it. They just kind of take the wrong approach. They start it in the wrong place. The second one is, where should we start when we approach the book of Revelation? And again, people rush to the wrong thing and they, they get into the wrong stuff. They start in the wrong place. The, the third one is, how should we position ourselves mentally, emotionally, spiritually? How should we position ourselves in reference to what is found in this book? And the, the fourth one would seem maybe a little odd and a little off, but it's how should we feel as we read this book? Because as you read it, it is such an emotional book. It provokes such emotion, and any good story does. Any good movie or, or story that you read or you get lost in is great at provoking an emotion and a feeling. So how should we feel as we read this? And so let's just begin with the first one. How should we approach this book? And let's begin in chapter one, verse one. John begins, this is a revelation from Jesus. This is a revealing. This is God is wanting to reveal something, open something up, show us something. He's wanting us to see something that we've not been able to see. This is a, a revelation from Jesus. This is something that Jesus is delivering. And God has given him this. So immediately, John is beginning to establish the authority of this revelation. He's saying, that this, guys, this is not something that I've created this is not something that I've dreamed up. This is not just a creative, ins 
in a moment of inspiration, but this is something that is from the throne of God. This is something that is from our Savior, from Jesus Christ, the Messiah himself. So I want you to understand the significance of this, the importance of this, the inspiration of this, and where this comes from. This comes from Jesus, and God gave it to Christ to show his servants, those who have a faithful relationship with him. He's, he's talking about his church, the church that he said he would build. Remember, he said he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Jesus would prepare his church, build his church, strengthen his church. And so that's what he's doing. He is showing his church something that would prepare them, build them, strengthen them. And his servants are faithful, are diligent followers and, and what is he showing him? The events that must soon take place. If you'll look down quickly in verse 19, he tells John, he says, I want you to write down what you have seen. Write down this revelation. Write down this vision. It is both the things that are now happening. This is present. This is, this is in the moment. This is relevant for now and for today. John, this is happening in your life. We'll see some things here in just a moment where John is not just writing Revelation. He is actually living the book of Revelation. He, he says, I want you to, to write what you have seen, both things that are now happening and things that will happen. This has a dual purpose for the church. It is to give them a strength and a confidence and a faithfulness to live to things that are happening to them in the now, but it's also to prepare them for things that they will face in the future. He so says, I want to show them things that are, that are to happen soon, that will soon take place. And he sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant, John, his faithful servant, John, who has faithfully, diligently, with great intentionality, reported everything that he saw. This isn't something that I just did frivolously. This isn't something I did haphazardly, but I was diligent in, in the way that I reported this. And everything that I saw, I, I wrote down with great detail. This is my report of the word of God. Again, he's establishing authority and credibility. The church, I want you to pay attention to what you're listening to, what you're reading. This is the word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ. So pay attention to this. There's a blessing attached to this. There's a blessing attached to this for the one who reads this to the church. And there's a blessing attached to this to the one who listens, who listens with an attentive ear, who listens with a humble ear, who listens to its message, this revelation has a message, has a, has, the story has a message that it's trying to teach us, who not just listens to the message, but also obeys what it says and pays attention for the time is near. This is relevant. This is real. This is applicable to your life. How should we approach this book? And many of us, as we start to look into the book of Revelations, we, we have an approach. And we would consider John, who he tells us is exiled to an island of Patmos. John, many would agree, there's, there's debate about this, about who John actually is. But many would agree that this is the Apostle John, the same John that wrote the Gospel of John, the faithful servant of Jesus and John is being punished, has been tortured by Roman officials for being a faithful servant of Jesus, a witness to the message of Jesus. He's done what Jesus has asked the apostles to do, to be a witness, to, to make more disciples, to build the church, to spread the message, to talk about the kingdom of God. And so in efforts to silence him, the Romans had tortured him. There's, there's reports that say that before he had been exiled to the island of Patmos, that the Roman officials had arrested him and plunged him into boiling oil in efforts to silence him. And when they pulled him out of the oil, the, the efforts to torture him had, had done nothing to his body. It's a miracle of God. And so they said, man, this, this isn't working. We can't silence him. We can't shut him up. What do we do? Let's, let's just remove him from where the people are. Let's get him to an island and exile him. And so we would see John in this in isolation, many would think. It's, it's probably likely that he's there with other exiles. He's actually in community. But 
in our minds, we would think John is seeing this vision, having this revelation in isolation. And so the thought might be that we ourselves, if we're going to understand this and study this, should get in isolation ourselves. So maybe we get on Amazon, we go to our favorite bookstore, we order a couple of the latest, greatest books on understanding revelation. Uh, We get our favorite translation of the Bible. We get a few blank journals, a yoga mat, because that's appropriate when studying the book of Revelation. (laughs) Our favorite coffee, and we find our isolated place And we begin to pray and we say, God, as I study the book of Revelation, as I approach this book, I want to approach it in a way. And I'm asking you to, God, would you help me? I want you for a moment in your mind to fill in in the blank. God, help me this book. And, And if I was a gambling individual, which I'm not, I would imagine the word that you placed in the blank would be, God, Would you help me understand this book? A lot of you walked in here thinking, man, I hope that they're going to help me understand what the heck is going on in Revelation. Because it is confusing. And and I don't know what this is, and I don't know who this is, and I don't know what the heck this is, or when this is, or what this means, or what this symbol means, or when this timeline is, or if this is really this, or if that's really that. It's just really confusing. And I I just kind of want to understand what the heck's going on. And I want to understand how the heck this is applicable to my life. And that's the approach a lot of people take to the book of Revelation. Here's the problem with that, both when we read this book and even with our life, is if we require understanding to move forward in the moments where confusion and cloudiness hit, it provokes paralysis and it prevents us from taking steps forward. And as believers, we have to learn how to still move forward even in the midst of confusion. And we have to know the faithfulness of God and we have to know the character of God and we have to have something that is a north star that keeps us moving towards God and in the direction of God and in the direction of his character even when there's stuff around us that is confusing and cloudy. Let me give you an example of this. There are two types of pilots that are given permission to fly. One type of pilot is only given permission to fly on clear, sunny days because they can only fly when they can see with clarity what's around them. They can see trees, they can see buildings, they can see mountains because they only know how to fly and reach their destination when they have clear understanding of where they are in reference to what's around them. But the moment clouds and fog move in and their vision is obscured, they no longer understand where they are in reference to everything else. And there's story after story after story of people that when fog and clouds move in, they get disoriented, discombobulated, and they lose understanding And they either get off course or they literally fly into something they don't know is there. And there's a catastrophic outcome. There's stories of people actually getting so confused that they actually fly their plane upside down and fly into the ground because they get so confused. And that's often how we get in the book of Revelations. We get so confused with the symbols and the timelines and the things that we get so focused on the details and we get so lost in the fog of the confusion that we fly into different opinions or different perspectives and we get lost into it. But there's a second kind of pilot that also is given permission to fly. The first, when fog moves in, they are immediately told to land the plane because they're not given permission to fly in the confusion of the fog and the clouds. But the second pilot has learned how to fly through the fog and through the clouds, because he's learned how to not depend on his visual understanding. There's something else that guides him through the confusion. There's a signal that keeps him pointed in the right direction. There's a signal that communicates with his plane 
and the destination where he's going that keeps him headed in the right direction that shows him what's around him and where he is in reference to stuff. He's learned to trust that signal even when he doesn't physically understand where he is in relation to everything else. And you and I have been given something called the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 14, 15, and 16 that he would give us the Holy Spirit and when we have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, he would lead and guide us into all truth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said this Holy Spirit that resides on the inside of us would give us the mind of Christ and would help us uncover and reveal what seems to be a mystery in God's word. He said that the Holy Spirit in 1 John is the perfect teacher that would teach us when even humanity struggles to teach us some things. And so when we, both in Scripture and in life, reach places that are foggy and cloudy, we have an ally, we have a signal, a gift of the Holy Spirit that we need to learn to listen to His voice. We need to learn to follow His leadership because He helps us through the fog. But there's also something else that John is teaching us here that's not in the approach of understanding, but it's the approach of obedience. He said, blessed is the person who hears and listens to the message and learns to obey what it says. The question and the prayer should not be, God, help me understand. The the prayer should be, God, I want to be a person. I want to be a servant. I want to be a faithful follower of Jesus. Help me read this book from a perspective and, and from approach that I am faithful and I am obedient to what the message of this book has to say. The approach is, God, would you help me obey the message of this book? And here's what's happened for me is when I change from help me understand to help me obey, the questions that I'm asking started to change. I stopped asking who, and I stopped asking, how does that affect my obedience? How does that prevent me from obeying? How does that encourage me to obey? What does this look like from an obedience perspective? I started seeing things that were telling me about the character of God and the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God and the loyalty of God and the forgiveness of God. And and I started seeing these trends and these these themes through the book of of Revelations. And and so let's look at a a practical example. One of the the things that I I heard and, and became deeply afraid of was going to the wrong dentist. Because if you went to the wrong dentist and they put you under, they might slip the mark of the beast in your root canal. (laughs) If you heard that teaching, read that article, read that book, or you go to the wrong doctor and they put you under, it's possible that they slip the the mark of the beast and you're somewhere and you're done, you know. I mean, there are crazy things like that that people are teaching out of this book. And when you don't, you're you're like, I don't understand how that could be. And what if, and uh, there's just crazy things like that that are being taught. But when you approach it from an obedient standpoint, you begin to understand, wait a minute. The mark of the beast is a mark of disobedience. It's a mark of rejection that I have rejected Jesus. It's not something I can stumble into. It's not something that I can by accident fall into, it is a choice. It says that they have taken the mark. They have chosen to reject one Savior, Jesus, and to accept one that has looked like a lamb, that has deceived them into saying that good is evil and evil is good. You begin to see that this mark is the mark of disobedience and rejection and rebellion to Jesus. And so you begin to see and ask different questions and, and you begin to see how this begins to change the approach and the questions. And so the right approach is not help me understand, although there are some things that God wants you to understand, but it is a approach of obedience. The second question that we want to ask, let me, let me get to this quote first, because this is a, a great quote from Alexander Stewart. He says, the book of Revelation is designed to motivate its hearers to reject compromise and to reject assimilation of the current modern culture 
and to embrace sacrificial discipleship. It thus has a powerful message for our current generation, for our current church, just as it has always had a powerful message to its original hearers. Christians must overcome. There is no other option. Alexander Stewart. It's a phenomenal book that he is saying, we have a responsibility to stay faithful to Jesus. And this book motivates us to be faithful in our relationship to Jesus, even when the culture puts pressure on us to compromise, to give up our our moral conviction. We are to be people that love all, welcome all, but we are to stay faithful in our relationship to Jesus and refuse to compromise, refuse to assimilate, and stay embracing of sacrificial discipline. We are to be obedient followers and servants of Jesus. Amen. The second question is, where should we start? And some of you are like, why are we in chapter one? It's boring. Let's get to the beast. Let's get to Armageddon. Let's get to the fun stuff. Let's get to the bowls and the trumpets and the four horsemen. That's the fun stuff. And yet that's not where John begins. He begins where we need to start. In verse four, he says, this is the letter from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you. That's the goal of this book. It is a goal that your life would experience grace, the grace of God and the peace of God. And it is coming from, its source is the one who is and the one who always was and the one who is still to come. I want you to notice something significant there. The timeline. This speaks to the eternal nature of God, that every part of time is rep- represented there. But notice the order of time. You would think it would be past, present, future. But the timeline there is present, past, and future. And I just think as a, a little note that before God can be the God of your past and your future, he has to be the God of your present. He has to be the God of your today. Before he can step in and heal the hurts of your yesterday, you've got to allow him to be the God of your now, the God of your present, the God of this moment. You got to give him access to your heart right now. And then he loves to step into your yesterday and heal the brokenness of your yesterday. He loves to step into your future and show you your purpose and your destiny and the significance of your tomorrow and help you navigate into your future. But you've got to give him permission to know you today and to be the God of your now. He is the one who is, he's the one who always was, and he's the one who is yet to come. The grace and the peace comes from the sevenfold spirit. When you see seven, it means complete. It means perfected. It means whole. This is a representation of the complete, full spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, before his throne and from Jesus Christ. Right here, we see the Trinity in perfect unity and perfect harmony. And Jesus is the faithful witness. That word witness is tied to the martyrdom, the cross, his crucifixion. He is a faithful witness to these things. And he is the first to rise from the dead, not the last. He's the first. And he is the ruler of all the kings of the world. He has authority. He has power. He has dominion. And all glory, not a little glory, not some glory, not partial glory, all glory belongs to him who loves us. This is one of the few places where God's love is put in the present tense. He loves us now. His love is active for us now. It is actively towards us. He is actively engaged in loving us right now. And he has done everything needed to forgive us for our sins by the shedding of his blood. And he has made us, you and I, right now, a kingdom of priests for God, his Father. All the glory and all the power to him forever and ever. Amen. Look, over and over and over throughout the book of Revelation, there's a command to look. And you need to be paying attention to what it is that you're looking at. Whatever has your attention, whatever it is that you're looking at, whatever is grabbing your attention, there's probably... It's probably the thing that you're worshiping the most. 
And he says, I want you to look and I want the thing to, that grabs your attention to not be the news, to not be the election, to not be Wall Street, to not be your circumstances, to not be the stress that you're in or the stress that you're under, but look, because he comes with the clouds of heaven and everyone will see him, not John, not the apostles, not the church, not the pastors, not the presidents, not the kings, not the stuff, not the beasts, not the, everyone will see him. Even those who pierced him, even those who rejected him, even those who opposed him, even those who hated him, and all the nations of the world will mourn for him, will long for him, will want him. Yes, and amen. And then we hear the voice of God. And we hear the thundering voice of God. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end, says the Lord. I am the one who is and who always was and who is still to come. I am the Almighty One, the one who's strong enough to do whatever. This is a, a reference. You see this, the I am is a reference from the Exodus where Moses says, who do I say sent me? As I go to, to say that God wants to deliver these people who are in slavery, and he says, I am. Tell them, I am sent me. I am the one who's strong enough to get you out of slavery. I am the one strong enough to get you through the desert. I am the one strong enough to get you into your promise. And here is the I am saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I can get you out of your slavery. I can get you through the difficulty of whatever you're going to see in Revelation. And I promise you, I can get you into the promise of your future. I am the Almighty One. And so where do, we, where, do we, where do we start? We start with an understanding of who, we, who, who our God is, what He's capable of, what He's done, who He is, who He was, and who He will be. And I love this quote from Dr. Chris Lakos. He says, if your eschatology, eschatology means the study of end things, end times, he says, if your eschatology does not begin with doxology, doxology means worship. If your eschatology does not begin with doxology, it is simply a dead theology. And I want to tell you something. If your eschatology, if your study of revelations is more consumed with who the beast is rather than with who Jesus is, you are focused on the wrong thing and you are looking at the wrong thing. And John says, I want us to start this book, this vision, this revelation, and I want us to look at, and I want us to understand who Jesus is because everything that we look at, everything that we read, everything that we see needs to be seen through the filter of who he is and what he has done. We need to know that he shed his blood to forgive our sins. We need to know that he is the first one to defeat death. We need to know that he's the first one to be resurrected. We need to know that he's the one who is who was and who is to come. We need to know that he's coming on the clouds. We need to know that all kings are under his power. We need to know that he is the Alpha and the Omega. We need to know that he's the Almighty One. Everything needs to begin and end with who Jesus is, with what he's done, and who he is in our life. And if our understanding or our study of the book of Revelation doesn't start there, we're starting in the wrong place. Amen. So then we begin to ask ourselves this question. How should we position ourselves? How should we position ourselves in our mind, and our heart, spiritually? And John says this in verse 17. He sees this incredible vision of Jesus. And he sees this hard to describe scene where there's seven lampstands and he sees one like the son of man. And John is fixing to see some incredible things that are hard to describe. And, and it's interesting that with all of the stuff that we're about to dive into here in a few weeks, the first thing that he sees is Jesus at the center of his church. And, and you and I need to know that when the world goes crazy, the place where Jesus will be is right at the center of his church. He'll be right here at the center of of his church. And he says, when I saw him, when I see this unspeakable, undescribable, and I've done the best that I can with 
the words that I can find to describe this undescribable Savior. Because I want you to see him the way that I saw him. Because you, you, I, I, I want... I want you to be able to worship him like I've worshiped him. Because you can't worship who you can't see. And this that's been a prayer for for me coming in to this weekend is that our church would be able to see Jesus in such a way that it would release us to be able to worship Jesus in such a a fresh way. He says, when I saw him, I couldn't help myself but fall at his feet as if I were dead. And this isn't a, like I was helpless in an involuntary kind of reaction. This, this was a, a willing act of humility. And John humbles himself before Jesus. And the question to how should you and I position ourselves, whether you're an expert, whether you're an assumer, whether you're an avoider, avoider, I, I think we ought to walk into this season of studying this book with sincere humility. And we ought to just kind of lay our opinions. We ought to lay our our history, our fears. We got to lay all of our stuff down and just say, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, with humility, lay it down. And I'm going to humble myself. because here, here's, here's what God says. He says, I resist the proud and the arrogant, but I give grace to the humble. And, and I will, when I've listened to people who teach some of this stuff, there's a difference between, because I love people that are confident in what they believe. I struggle to listen to people that are arrogant about what they believe. And there's a difference. There's, there's people that teach their, their doctrine and theology, and they teach it from a position of humble confidence, and I love that. There's other people that teach it from a place of arrogance, and I, man, I struggle with that. And, and here John just says, I, I humbled myself before Jesus. And, and I'm, I'm walking through this in this season with the humility of I, I'm coming not as an expert, but just I, I want to continue to learn. I want to continue to be a student. I want to continue for my mind and my heart to be shaped by, by what this book has to say to me, to our church. I want this to, to shape me. And I, I love... I love what Jesus does because anytime somebody humbles themselves before him, regardless of their condition or, or what they're going through, he can't help but go to them. Woman at the well, woman with the issue of blood, um, woman caught in adultery, John here, Peter on the shore. Uh, he can't help but just get to them. And he walks over to John. And, and, when, and when we read this a few weeks ago, I was just, I, I, I read this and my eyes just fill with tears. Because I remember different times in my life. A lot of it, you know, when I was a teenager. Some of it when I was a kid. I remember hearing things taught from this book. And I remember laying in my bed at night, scared to death from things I'd seen, heard, read, terrified of what might happen, confused. But I don't don't ever remember anybody reading this verse. I don't ever remember anybody telling me about Jesus walking up to John and just saying, hey, John, I'm going to show you some crazy stuff. But don't be afraid. How are you and I supposed to feel as we read this book? Well, Jesus tells us how we're not supposed to feel. We're not supposed to feel afraid. 
Matter of fact, when we read it and we dig in it to it, this weird thing starts happening where we start to feel hopeful. <laughs> we start to feel inspired. And we start to feel confidence in our God. And, and yes, there's some scary stuff in here. I'm not going to deny that. But we start to read it from a different place and a different filter. And so why, why would there be fear? There's a couple of reasons for that. One, one, we've maybe read it in a confusing way. Or we've heard incorrect or incomplete teaching that has left room for our enemy Satan to get into our ear and kind of twist. He likes to twist and confuse. The Bible says that God does not give us a spirit of fear, that God is not the author of confusion, but that Satan is the father of all lies. And so Satan loves to bring fear into our life. He likes to confuse us. And we see with Eve, we see with Jesus, we see in different places where he's trying to twist what God's word says. So anytime there's a little crack or a little opportunity, especially with something like Revelation where it's foggy, confusing, there's, there's so much symbolism, he likes to get in and twist it and bring doubt and bring confusion. And if he can leverage the word of God to bring fear into your life, ah, oh, it's so, it's, it's like his favorite thing. If he can use the word of God to make you afraid of God or make you afraid of the things of God makes his day. And so that, that's one possibility. But, but look, look at this. Look at this. This is beautiful. Right above, John sees Jesus and he's holding seven stars in his right hand. He's standing in the middle of seven lampstands. He's holding seven stars in his right hand. And down below, it, it explains this. He says this, the seven lampstands are the churches and the seven stars are the angels of the churches. Or some, there's, there's some translation stuff going on there, but some might say that's the spirit of the churches, heart of the churches. Here's, here's the point. Whatever is in his hand is safe, is protected. John, John chapter 10, verse 27, listen to this. This is, this is beautiful. From the New American Standard says this. It says, my sheep, this is Jesus talking. He says, my sheep, my followers, my people, my sheep listen to my voice and I know them. I have a relationship with them and they follow me. We, we have this thing. We have this relationship and I give them eternal life and they never perish. Listen, listen to this. Listen to this. No one. No one, nothing will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. There's nothing, no one greater than him. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. Whatever is in his hand is safe. Whatever is in his hand is protected. And so when you and I read this, we can say, if I belong to God, I'm in his hand. If I'm a follower of Jesus, if I've given my heart to Jesus, if I've given my life to Jesus, I'm in his hand. And my heart, my life, my eternity, my future is in his hand. Now, John is, is, is seeing this, is, is writing this. And remember, John was just dipped in boiling oil. John was just exiled to an island. So his life is not comfortable. His life is not just posh and he's not just living. His, his flesh is still going through some stuff. But, but Jesus is saying, hey, you, you may go through some difficulty on this earth, but your life, your eternity is, you, you may go through some persecution, but stay faithful, stay faithful, stay faithful. Your heart, your future, your eternity is in my hand and nobody, nothing, no matter what you go through, can snatch you out of my hand. And that's the drive. The church is motivated to reject compromise and assimilation and to embrace sacrificial di discipline. And it's a powerful message to just motivate you to stay faithful to Jesus no matter what we experience on this life in a crazy world. To say, stay faithful to Jesus. You are, so we can read this with a confidence. And the only thing that would provoke fear is a twist of the enemy of God's word or the fact that 
you're not yet in his hand. The only reason you should be afraid is if you're not yet in his hand. Because if you're in the hand of God, you got nothing to be afraid of. Because he says, listen, you're, you're in my hand and, and you don't need to be afraid, John, because I'm the first and the last. I am the living one. And listen, <laughs> I, 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 I was dead. But look, I'm alive. I'm alive forever and ever. And better yet, I hold the keys to death and the grave. The thing that's trying to intimidate you, the thing that's trying to pressure you, the thing that's trying to get you to cave, I got the keys. I, I have the power over them. And so John, I'm gonna walk with you through this and you have nothing to be afraid of. And so as we dive into this book, for those of us that have avoided it because of fear, you don't have to be afraid you can walk through this with grace and peace and let this book speak to you and motivate you and draw you closer to Jesus and let you become a servant of Jesus that is fearlessly obedient to who he is and what he has called you and us as the church to be in the world today. Father, I thank you for the gift of this book, for the gift of this revelation that calls us as the church to faithful obedience, to faithful service. And I pray that over the next few weeks as we dig in to this revelation, that you give us clear understanding in the midst of confusion. You help us understand the message and the story. Some of us may get lost in the details and in the symbolism and then the things, but can we, by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, fly through the fog and stay focused on Jesus? And may this draw us into a deeper place of worship and understanding of who you are, your greatness, your significance, your goodness. Today, I want to make sure that you're in God's hand. I don't want you leaving here without an opportunity to say, I want to be in God's hand. I want to be safe. I want to be protected. I don't want to have to be afraid of what might happen in my eternity. If you are a child of God, you are safe. Your heart, your eternity is safe. You don't have to be afraid. And I hope that you get that freedom today. And you can walk out of here with that confidence and that peace and that grace. But maybe there's someone here that's just unsure. You've never given your life to Jesus. And you want to make that decision today. Nobody's looking around. We're not going to embarrass you. I'm just going to ask you here in a moment to slip your hand up and tell me. We're going to lead you in a, a simple prayer. And then we'll give you an opportunity to connect with a, a team member if you choose afterwards. I believe you know the Spirit of God is pulling on you right now, telling you this is your moment. This is a significant decision. You don't have to understand everything, you don't have to know all the answers. This is your moment to say, I want to be in a relationship with Jesus. I want to be a faithful follower and accept him as the Lord and the leader of my life. I was looking around with myself and a couple of ushers. If that's you, would you just tell me right now by putting your hand up saying, hey, I want to make that decision. Anybody in the room want to give their life to Jesus? Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. So good. I'll give you just a couple of seconds, a couple of minutes. Won't wait long. Anybody else? Join these few. It's a big deal. People are playing for you right now. Do you kind of wrestle with this? Don't wait. All right, church family, we're going to pray with these that have responded. We're going to help lead them into the family of God. This is a big deal, big moment. So we're going to pray together and we're going to pray loud and proud. Just repeat after me. Say, Father, 
I come to you and I thank you that you sent Jesus to take my place, die on the cross and pay the price for my sin. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart, become the Lord and the leader of my life. I make a commitment to follow you, to surrender to you. Be the Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me, for setting me free, and for changing me forever. Amen.